We're going to talk about the resurrection. Now, the resurrection, it's not even Easter, so why are we talking about the resurrection? Beats me, I ran out of material. The thing is, the resurrection, listen to me, the resurrection is one of the most important subjects pretty much in all history. Here's why. When it comes to Christianity, when it comes to Jesus, nobody really has a problem with you talking about Jesus. I mean, some people do, but I mean, it's rare for you to talk about Jesus and then people get upset. But when you say that Jesus is the God, well, then we have people throwing fisticuffs, right? We have a problem. Because it is this exclusive claim that he is not just God, but the God, and there is no other God. And that is a pretty big claim. A pretty big claim. And, um, you know, other people can go around saying, hey, you know what, I, I'm this and I'm that. And, um, but unless they have something to back up their claims, it's meaningless, right? Those statements are meaningless. When Jesus was on this earth, not only was he a good teacher, as many people just say that Jesus is, Jesus himself claimed to be the God. The God. And when we're talking about Jesus, not only did he claim to be the God, he called himself the Son of Man in Matthew 26. Um, uh, Matthew 26, the Son of Man in Matthew 16, the giver of eternal life in John 10, 28. The one with the Father, John 10, 30. One who gives forgiveness of sins, Mark 2, 10. Bread of life, the good shepherd, true vine, the great I am, the giver of the uh, living water, and so on and so on. Exclusive claims that only Jesus claimed to be. And I'm sure that many of you guys have heard the Lord, liar, and lunatic argument. And we'll explain that here in a minute. But with all these claims that Jesus was God... And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. And only true salvation lies in Jesus. He is going to give you the forgiveness. All these statements made by Jesus, they're meaningless. Unless there is validity. Unless there is proof. Right? Romans 1, 4. If you want to turn, if you have a Bible, great. Go to it. If you don't have one, you can download it on your app store right now. All right? Get it. Romans 1, 4 says this. Oh, oh and we got these fancy new technology where I just say it and it comes on the... How do they do that? It's crazy. Actually, let's go to verse 3. See, you know, it's a little slow. It's lagging. Okay, good. <laughs> Concerning his son who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Notice what it says here. It says that Jesus Christ was declared to be God by the resurrection. So it's important for us to understand the resurrection because if we don't understand the resurrection, we don't understand that Jesus is God. So if you take away the, rection, the, the resurrection and you, and you have all these other statements that Jesus has made, then you just have a good teacher, right? And that's what a lot of people think. Jesus is a good teacher. He was a wise man. He lived by principle. He was very, we love this one, he was very accepting and very loving, right? But then we forget that he's God. Because we discredit the resurrection. And I want us to look at this today. And actually what I want to look at is something very interesting, a, a little different approach. C.S. Lewis gives an argument called the Lord, Liar, Lunatic. How many of you guys have ever heard of that before? The Lord, Liar, Lunatic. I'm going to, basically, the statements given by Jesus, the proclamations given by Jesus, you can't just basically say he's just a good teacher because no, I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher, all right? Um, I got a couple of my former students here. Now, in my class, if I were to say, check this out, if I said, listen, take out your Bibles, for I am the Lord. 
okay, well, hold on. Like, it wouldn't just be like, oh, what, what should we turn to? No, it would stop, and somebody would be like, I'm sorry, what did you just say? I'd be like, I said I'm God. Now open up your Bible, thus saith DK. <laughs> now, if, if, if I said that, now what would happen? People would be, first of all, I've been almost fired a bunch of times. That would be the most fireable offense. That would. They'd be like, all right, DK, enough, right? Because, I mean, that, that's pretty crazy to say something like that, right? I have to have validity. Now, if I said, <laughs> I'm not even good. If I said I'm God because I can make this pencil into rubber, and then I start shaking it from that end, and then it starts wobbling, you'd be like, what the heck? you break it. You'd be like, see, you know. You would expose me for the liar that I truly am, right? You would say, prove that you're God. My statements don't mean, um, my statements aren't irrelevant. They mean something. This is what C.S. Lewis says about this argument. It's kind of a lengthy quote, and I, I'm not very goodly at reading, so bear with me. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him being Christ. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or else something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Now, it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend. And consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. I didn't even stumble. That was pretty good. You see, Jesus made claims where you look at those claims and they are, if you heard somebody just walking in the street saying, I'm God, I'm God, you would not just go, he is. Bless his name forever. No, you would say, this man, what the heck, you need to get out of here, you're crazy. Sit down for a second, hide under your bush for a little bit longer, and just, you know, you would not, you would not accept it. But people will look at Jesus' claims and say, I like this and I like that. I'll accept that. No, 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 no. What Jesus taught about how people ought to be must be and cannot be, must be accepted with his other claims and cannot be separated from it. Now, if the Bible says that he was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection, we must look at the resurrection. Now, the resurrection is very interesting. Ready for this? This is, this is pretty crazy. The resurrection is in the Bible, but it's also in secular history. What do I mean by that? What I mean is in history by Jews and Romans who did not believe in Christianity whatsoever. And this is by atheists and secular people the like, whether they were religious or not, both said that tomb was empty, we don't know what happened. And so, when, when atheists or, and by the way, I used to be, so, you know, Understand that I've looked at this objectively. I've come at this with the same perspective. When they have looked at the resurrection, when they've looked at this missing person in the tomb, there's all these questions, but not even just questions, there's more excuses, right? You try to rationally try to figure out what happened with Jesus. It's really 
a very interesting question. What happened to the body? Christians have one answer. Jews have another. And well, Romans have the same. Well, depending on different people's theories. But how is it? That we have discredited, and and by the way, this is just ridiculous, that we've said Jesus never existed. That's like saying uh, uh, that George Washington never existed. Jesus never existed, and the resurrection or, or, or the missing body, I mean, that's all irrelevant. That never happened. No, I'll tell you right now, outside of the Bible, outside of it, it happened. So if you sit there and go, well, I don't believe in the Bible. Okay, that's fine. Everything you base your understanding of Roman and Greek and Jewish culture, they all say the body was missing. Not because Jesus never existed. Where they're all like, we put someone in there, we forgot. Oh, he must have never existed. No. It was, he's gone. So what happened? Today, I'm going to give you the most popular theories that atheists and secular um, historians have come up for the resurrection. Now, I will say the first argument is a bit of a straw man argument. It's kind of (laughs) like, you know, but it is a legitimate argument because historians have come up with two real categories to explain away the resurrection. You ready? Two of them. Number one, they hallucinated. And that's a popular one. And number two, the disciples lied. And we're going to look at those two real categories. First is the hallucination theory. The hallucination theory says this theory, uh, sorry, theory, this theory says that all of Christ's post-resurrection appearances were really only supposed appearances and were all hallucinations by his so-called disciples, and other people who encountered it. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. And this is a legitimate theory. Of the historical 500 people who saw him at one time, and the disciples, and his family, and all the other witnesses, everyone was tripping. They were on that lean. What the heck are we saying here? That, first of all, hallucinations aren't a common thing. You understand that, right? You don't just walk out of your house, oh, Dora the Explorer. Okay, moving on. You don't just do that, right? You understand that. And the first time it would happen, I'd say, let's go to the hospital. Hospital? Hospital? Hospital. Yeah, okay. I'm hallucinating. Okay. You know what I'm saying, right? This is not a common enough occurrence where, first of all, I just, it drives me crazy that this is actually a theory and it's accepted. That if you have one person having a hallucination, it is a very serious thing, but 500 people at one time? This is not Coachella. <laughs> this is not, no, there was not, this is a legitimate theory too, the shrooms theory, not even kidding that the disciples were on shrooms and many of the people were on shrooms so that they saw Jesus in a certain... I'm not kidding. (laughs) Now, you might be thinking, I know it's funny. And I brought this one up first because it's just so funny. I I just think it's hilarious. I just watched a documentary It's a dope documentary. It's on Netflix. It's called The Keepers. And it's about this nun who was killed. Basically, she found out about some sexual exploitation and a scandal that was happening with the priest. And it turns out that there was 35 to upwards to 100 women who came forward and said, this man took advantage of me. And it's funny, not funny, but sad and sick that the people who heard it did not even listen but said, it's all hearsay. 
A hundred different women. A hundred different women. It would be just as foolish if the police who heard all these accusations must have said, well, they're all having hallucinations. Now, if something like that happened today, if 500 people witnessed a crime, we would all say, what else do you see? What else do you need? Wouldn't we? But 500 people see Jesus in the flesh at one time, and he's obviously, these people are tripping. Whatever they got, I want some. What on earth? Now, I don't really have to really do away with that. Theory. Hallucinations don't work that way. They don't. And so it's illogical, irrational, and we will dismiss it. The impersonation theory. There is in Scripture when Jesus rose from the dead that some of the disciples, not even the disciples, but some people, uh, well, yes, yeah, some of the disciples, but some people also were looking at Jesus and were saying, I, is, that, is that really him? I, I don't know. And so, because it says that some doubted, which I think is an excellent testimony that this is, the Bible's true, right? They're telling you exactly what people were like, no way. This, I can't, no. As if somebody rose from the dead in front of my eyes and I'd be like, no, I believe it. No, I'd be like, no, there's no way. There's no way. So this is the theory. And this is a legitimate theory as well. And it's actually more popular than the hallucination theory. That there was an impersonator. The impersonation theory is that they, the disciples... Clever disciples were scheming. They were like, let us find someone who looks exactly like Jesus. This is true. And again, I say it with such a tone that is comedic, but take away the tone and just look at what I'm saying. The disciples gathered around. They, they sought after somebody said, oh, you look like Jesus. Hey, come here. Come here. I got a proposition for you. I need you, just whatever you want, you got it. First, I need you, you don't need your wrists anymore. Let's just put a couple holes through them, just right here and right here. And I have this spear, I kind of need to rub it in your rib cage, just a little rub. Put a hole in your feet. Let me see your back. Oh, that's, that's not going to do. Can I just rip the skin off of that for a second? And would you just go around and just do a little meet and greet with everyone and just say, hey, guys, it's me, Jesus. And we'll give you whatever you want. But just know after you've made your appearance, say things that were exactly like Jesus, then we're going to make you disappear. Is that okay? How do you get this person? Where do you get this person? Do you make sure the length of the hair is correct? If not, what do you get some? It's not like Esau, right? You know, Jacob and Esau, where he put some, you know, some lamb, lamb hair on his, uh, on his arm. It's not what happened, right? It, it's, think about the legitimacy of this argument. Anybody? Oh, I'm weird. I'm in a Russian church. Y'all know about Rasputin, right? I mean, y'all know about Rasputin, right? Crazy dude. Crazy dude. Now, what, what, how many times did he get shot? A couple. Well, let's just say a couple. And he got stabbed, right? And then he got poisoned, right? Enough to poison how many men? Like three, four men? Yeah. A good, a good amount of poison. And then, and then, so he had poison, and he got shot, and he got stabbed, and then he what? He drowned is the actual way he died, right? It's crazy. Okay. Okay, all right, a little different. Try to keep it for the kids. Um, but imagine they were like, all right, we want to we wanna make sure that people don't think Rasputin's dead. All right, so I know everyone wants to kill you. Um, let's get someone who looks just like him. So come here, you, and everyone hates you, and everyone wants to kill you right now, but just act like you're Rasputin. 
you're not bloody enough. Here, can, <clears throat> let me get a little bit, boom, boom, you know, drink this poison, you know. And then go around and say, you're Rasputin. No! Who's going to do that? Who's going to be like, I will be pierced through my wrists and be, nobody. And if you found someone that crazy, you wouldn't say, you kind of look like him. So <laughs> I guess you're going to fool the family. It's going to be easy. I mean, think about it. His mom and his brothers were there and saw him. Would they not be like, hey, you're not Jesus. I mean, don't you think? But apparently, this is one of the best theories we got. Some guy dressed up like Jesus, pierced, and why am I saying pierced like somebody really, no, well, maybe Jesus rose from the dead and acted like he didn't have scars. No, we got Thomas to prove it. Thomas said, let me feel your scars. Remember? And so he put his finger into his wounds. So we know that it was just not uh, these, this person who was just in just a robe and it was like, hey, it's me. We know that because in the scriptures and outside of it, we have people testifying that he had scars. This is not a good theory. Now, those are more comical. Is this water here for me? Cool. If not... I'm sorry, we now have whatever. I have what you have. Okay. <laughs> the next theory is the most popular. It is the Discovery Channel theory. It is the his History Channel theory. It is the most popular theory. It is called the Swoon Theory. The Swoon Theory. Now, how many guys... Uh, we don't, I, don't, I don't listen to, like, today's music... But if there's like a really big band, I don't think there is. Let me go back to, um, do you guys know the Beatles? I'm, I don't even, you probably don't. Um, but the Beatles, okay? There's a big band from England, all right? And they play rock and roll, obviously. They're of the devil. Um, and uh, they, they played rock and roll and, you know, and girls, man, I watched the video. I had a history of rock and roll class in college. I know, right? Um, and it was just to fill... Um, units. Um, and I watched it, and there was this video about these fans of the Beatles. And trust me, you think people are idolaters now. Dude, whew, crazy. These girls, like when a guy, when one of the Beatles would walk by them, you would see a bunch of them fall over like dominoes. It was just like, boom, 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 boom. like girls would just, ah. I'm not kidding. Girls were overheating, and it was like in the wintertime. And I'm like, dang, that is power. That is power. But they swooned. You know, when I come home, that's what my wife does, right? She sees me. Oh, my gosh. Not really. Not really. Not really. To be honest, it's quite the opposite. No, it's a... I swoon. I come in. Same noise, too. I come, I come in. I, I, no, I come in. Sorry, go back. Uh, the, these girls would... Oh, they would swoon, they would pass out, they would faint, and they would wake up, and they'd be like, what happened? And they would see the Beatles' afterglow, right? I mean, that's what would happen. This is the swoon theory, you ready? After Jesus died, oh, sorry. <laughs> After Jesus was crucified and wrapped up in linen and put into the tomb, and the stone was rolled in front of it, Jesus woke up three days later, <laughs> moved the stone, got past the Roman centurion, and went to Emmaus. Let me say that one more time. This is the most popular, the biggest, most logical reason. Not kidding. Jesus, when he was first flogged, which means 39 lashes with bones and glass that would dig into his skin and rip it, and it was from the top of the neck all the way to the buttocks. And what would happen is the skin would rip off, and so muscles would be torn, and bone would be shown, 
Intestines even could be shown. And after all that blood loss, as he had to carry his cross to Golgotha, and losing more blood along the way, he now is being impaled with his wrists right here and with his feet. And he is on the cross for six hours. Six hours. And instead of going and breaking the legs so that, and by the way, with the cross, what it does is obviously, uh, not obviously, but it's a suffocation device, right? It's meant to make you suffocate. The more you drop down, you, your, your lungs collapse. So in order for you to continue to breathe, you need to push up on the nails that are in your feet in order to take a breath. So Jesus was suffering for six hours, and here he is up and up and down, up and down in order to breathe, and he's not dead yet that they see, and it's starting to rush, uh, like uh, time's moving on, they need to move on fast, so they're breaking everyone's legs, they come to Jesus, and they say, uh, this man's already dead, and they said, well, just give him a good old stab in the ribs just to make sure. Now, he's at an angle where he's high up, so they're going to take the spear and go through his rib cage, or it's going to go through his lungs, possibly his heart. It's going to go shoop, shoop. That's why blood and water came out. So after this, they wrapped him in. All, by the way, all of that is historically verifiable, even outside of Scripture. They wrapped him with linen and then put him in a tomb. Three days later, he's rejuvenated. He's like, that, I really needed that nap. Let me, let me tell you, my wife is pregnant. And sometimes she'll be out for, before she would never nap. Now she's out for three hours, and I, sometimes I have to tap her to see if she's alive. But as soon as she wakes up, boom, she's ready to go. I know my uh, father-in-law, he works like 12 to 14 hours a day. He will literally pull off to the freeway, uh, on the side of the freeway, take a five-minute nap and be rejuvenated for the rest of the day. I don't get it. I don't get it. I need my eight hours, eight to 12. I'm good, right? No. I need my sleep. But I'm sorry. There's no way that uh, after that unbelievable crucifixion, three days uh, later, he's like, oh, feel good. Let's go to Emmaus. Think about the insanity. Think about it. Now, uh, when you guys go to camps, there's a, there's a popular game that when you go to a, uh, a Christian camp, it's called, I think it's called Kanjabi, Kajabi, Can Can. What happens is people just hold ropes and they pull on the rope. It's like tug of war, but you're all by yourself and it's in a circle and you try to throw people in the trash can. Not even kidding. That, we, we are terrible. But that's the game. It's almost as bad as Katorska, where you beat the person for messing up. Now, but what happens is when people let go of the ropes, it's every single time, I've been to too many Christian camps to hear, hear otherwise, every single time, for the love of Pete, to chook. Here's what happens. They go, oh, I can't go anymore. My hands hurt. And they, have, they go, like, look at my blisties. Blisties, not even blisters, blisters, because they've gone total, ah, and, they, and you know, afterwards they act like they literally have done the hardest thing imaginable. And they can't even pick up their cup of water. They're like, oh, oh, you know. And you're trying to tell me that when we have an ingrown toenail, we're out for a week, but Jesus took a three-day nap after having his skin ripped off his back, having a spear shoved in his lungs, and with his feet and with these pierced wrists, he is pushing aside a stone. Not only that, but he is able to sneak past these guards that they sleep apparently through this big boulder being moved, and they're looking, they're like, Ugh. 
what? You know, they're not even, they're still asleep. And he's just like a trail of blood. They still don't know where he's at. Think about this for a second. I know, I know as logical atheists or logical people, we don't want to take logic and add it to the scriptures. But I, but I challenge you. How would you look at this? I want you to know that Emmaus is seven miles away from where Jesus is at. Seven miles away. So after he pushes this away, no food because he's the bread of life, he's walking to Emmaus for seven miles? He's like, you know, I fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights. This boulder, I can do all strength, all things through me who strengthens me. No, you're missing it. He was dead. And if somebody tells you after all of that, they're like, I don't believe he really died. That person is not listening. I want you to know that a little with a gunshot, one little hole could kill you. Jesus' whole back is ripped off. He's got a spear in his lungs, two holes in his wrists and his feet, and you're like, uh, it's debatable. What's the debate? What's the debate? By the way, they say, well, the Romans, the Roman guards, the centurions, they didn't, they didn't kill him. Bruh. They're professional killers. There was already two guys there before he got there. The two thieves. It's not like they were like, so how do we do this again? Like... Are we going to? No. No. They know how to do it. They've done it tons of times. You're saying that this one time, that the most prolific person, which has an angry mob behind him, says, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, that they're like, should we crucify him? Are you kidding me? And Rome, listen, Rome needed the Jews. They needed the Jews. Everything in Roman culture, whether with Pilate, whether with the Jews, whether with the government, whether with Caesar, everything that the, the Roman culture, the, the empire of Rome needed the Jews. So why would they want to upset the very people they needed? But apparently, after hearing all these people, even though Pilate even said, I find no fault with him, but crucify him anyways, that they're going to, uh, I don't know about this. Guys, for Christians, well, for atheists who look at Christians and say, Christians, you don't, you don't use your mind. Catch 22. Isn't it ironic that with all of this ex ex explicit details, that we would even have the thought that maybe he was asleep? The theft theory. The theft theory. This is another very popular one. And I want you to really think about this because this is where people are like, ah, oh, well, he didn't fall asleep. The disciples stole him, okay? That's the theory. It's one of the oldest. It's actually in the scriptures. I want you to think about this. So here's these disciples. Well, wait. Let's, let's go back, okay? Before the, this, this all happened, um, and Jesus is being, um, you know, he, he's getting ready to be crucified. People are, they're putting him on trial, right? Where, where are the disciples? Oh, they're nowhere to be found? Oh, why? Because they're, what's that word? Uh, blah, 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 blah. Afraid? Uh, even the strongest of all the disciples denied him three times. They want nothing to do with Jesus at this moment. They're afraid. They're like, let's crucify this man. Anyone associated with him? And they're like, huh. Who is that guy? Never seen him before. And they're gone. Gone. So now, 
We have Jesus. And by the way, historically, Jesus by himself, no disciple. Now all of a sudden, when Jesus dies, even though these guys just spent three years following this man that they thought to be God, and they go to his tomb, which they're like, okay, no one's going to be like, well, this is God's tomb. No, think about it for a second. They're thinking, three years? He's dead? Wasted my time. How do we know this? What happened to Peter? What did he do? He went back to doing what? Being a fisherman. Within three days, he's like, I'm gone. I'm going to go back to what I know best. So you're telling me that these disciples snuck past these two Roman guards. About 11 of them. And they went, Look, I've played video games before, but that's ridiculous. I mean, I've played some stealth games where you're like, dude, come on. Like, I'm making all this noise and nothing's happening. Look, 11 dudes are like, shh, go, go, quiet. Look, if my dog gets up in the middle of the night, I'm like, huh? Seriously. I want you to think, if someone was in your room moving your dresser, on hardwood floor. <laughs> no. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. 11 men moving this stone. Okay, let's not even say that. Let's say they beat up these Roman soldiers. Yes, these fishermen, these tax collectors. They're like swinging their coins. Hey, hey, hey. You want to go? <laughs> Not going to happen. Done. Done. It's not, it's not, for, first of all, we don't have a motive for them because they're cowards. They're afraid. They're already going back to their work. We don't have a motive. And two, we don't have capability. And if you're going to look at anything, look at that. You have no capability. You have men who are completely not, not able to sneak past him, but that was the most logical thing they could think of is, well, that's what the Romans said, is that just say you were asleep and they snuck it past you. But even that is ridiculous. So they didn't steal him. They didn't, he didn't fall asleep. They weren't on shrooms. They didn't take some guy who looked like Jesus and lastly, there's the unknown tomb theory. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not trying to laugh at it and make it bad because I'm laughing. I just think it's funny. First of all, this is one of the earliest theories. And the theory is that they all went to the wrong tomb. Everyone. Everyone. So all the Roman guards, <laughs> they woke up and they're like, what are we doing? <laughs> His tomb is rolled away. They're like, where, where is he? Because apparently while they were sleeping, they rolled over to some other tomb. And they were like, oh, where is it? Come look. And everyone came. And the, the women who came and checked out the tomb, they were like, this, Wrong one, too. And every single person was like, I can't believe he's gone. But right next to it, <laughs> is Jesus in the tomb? Come on. By the way, we know that this, the tomb that was given was by Joseph of Arimathea, who was a famous Jew of the Sanhedrin, a very prolific Jew. You have a specific name like that, they can just go, hey, let's go to Joseph's tomb. It's empty. Okay. That's like, all right, this happened just yesterday. Somebody said, hey, dude, 
I'm over by your apartment. Can I stop by? I said, yeah, apartment 206. And he came, he said, what apartment are you at? 206. How else can I say it? 206. And he's like, oh, all right, thanks, dude. 206. Open up 206. Guess who's there? Me. Because I said I live in 206. Now, if I said 206 and he opens the door at somebody else's house, it would, first of all, I'd have a lot of explaining to do. But if I kept doing that with every single person that ever came to my house, something's wrong with me. I'm hallucinating. Every single person was misdirected. Even Joseph of Arimathea. Even he didn't know where his own tomb was. Listen, these are the best theories we've got. Clean to them. Hold fast to these. Could it be that all these conclusions don't match up because maybe Christ actually rose from the dead? You say, I don't believe it. It's not possible for someone to raise from the dead. You're right. But with God, all things are possible. I think we forget that. Somebody comes, I love this. I, I, I did this all the time as an atheist. I go, that's not logical. Well, because you've taken supernatural things out of the equation. So you say, it's not logical. If I say everything is illogical that has some supernatural thing, well, then I'm not really taking, I, I, I'm not taking an argument for Christianity seriously. Listen, if all these things don't match up, if none of these things are clear, why, what else could it be? Then Jesus rose from the dead. The stone is rolled away. Disciples are cowards. Jesus is appearing to 500 people at one time. He is making testimony and testimony and testimony. By the way, can I say this real quick? When the Jew, oh, sorry, <clears throat> when the disciples, after the resurrection, they went from cowards into martyrs. How did they go from people who were afraid, then all of a sudden people who are willing to die and did die for the faith just like that? Especially if they're just wanting to create their own religion when they die for their fake religion. And it's not like one quick little, you know, Kool-Aid. You guys know what that's about. It's not a shot to the head. These are suffering. These are burning alive for the sake of Christ. And guess what happened with these, these martyrs, these disciples? Guess where they were when they first got the commission. They went and preached in Jerusalem. And where did this all take place? Jerusalem. Where did all of this, with, with all the Jews, where did they think? And what did they think about the, the resurrection? They said, well, his body's gone, but something must have happened. And that's where Peter says, he is resurrected. He's God. And listen, when you have these statements that you have all these arguments and you really look at them objectively, but then you add supernatural uh, uh, circumstances into the equation, it's logical, it's rational, it's reasonable. Jesus rose from the dead. Without any doubt in my mind, he rose from the dead. Now, hold on. If he rose from the dead, and if, based off Romans 1, 1, 4, he was declared with power to be the Son of God, to be God alone. If that's true, This is mind-blowing. God came and dwelt among us. 
and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. And as he lived his life, he lived full of grace and truth. He loved people, but he also loved God with all his mind, heart, soul, and strength. He loved his neighbor as himself. There wasn't a moment in time that he did not stop loving God and that he did not lo stop loving people. And he earned righteousness. He fulfilled the law because all those commandments hang upon those two commandments. All of the law is built on those two commandments. So he fulfilled righteousness that we fell short of. See, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fallen short of the righteousness required to be in a relationship with God. Every single person here, listen, you're a sinner. You say, how dare you? You don't know me. You're right. But I know God. And I know you're not like him. And that's why I say you're a sinner. Sin means anything against God. It just means anything against his character, his nature, his purposes, his promises. And we are vastly different than him. But listen, the wages of sin is death. The wages for our sin was damnation, was hell, was separation from God. Listen, God dwelt among us. And when we saw his glory, he took himself and he suffered, bled, was ripped into pieces for our sin, for my sake. It's not a joke. It's not something to, to, to look over and be like, I already know this. This is everything. When Jesus came and died, but then he, when he rose from the dead, he says, <coughs> all those who need life, I can give it to you. Because though I died, I am life within myself. And nothing can defeat me. Nothing can hold me back. I can give you the same life that you need because I am the eternal life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. We need it. We need it. <clears throat> Is it any wonder people get so caught up with the idea of hell that they don't understand that hell is eternal death, but eternal life, which is heaven, is because the eternal life is there. You say, how could God send people to hell? You don't want him. You chose not to have him. And when you Choose that. God says, you get it. But my friends, God does not want that. That's why he came. That's why he died. That's why he rose. And that's why he offers salvation to you. He offers life to you. I'm not talking about the forgiveness of sins. Stop with that. I'm talking about the forgiveness of sins so that you can be with God. You can have life. It's not enough to say, okay, my slate is clean. No, you're missing it. You need God. And God came to this earth to show you how much you need it. You need God so much that God died just to show you how much you need him. That's crazy. Believers, isn't it awesome to trust in our risen Savior? And we don't just got to do it because it's Easter. We're doing it every single day. He is alive. And he is seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us in prayer. And we can come to him anytime we want. And he is with us anytime in our day. And we have fellowship and communion and joy in Christ at all times. Praise be to Christ that he rose from the dead. Amen.
That's everything to us. For those who believe. Now, for those of you who don't. He has rose from the dead. And if he's rose from the dead, he did it to save you from the dead. He did it. It's accomplished. You don't have to, you don't have to sit here and go, I gotta clean myself up, I gotta, I gotta fix my life up, I gotta be better. No, you don't. He's best. It doesn't matter how well you can fix yourself up. It doesn't matter if you go, you know, as a, in the Russian, in Russian churches, it's like, am I ready for baptism? Listen, you're ready for baptism when Christ has baptized you with his Holy Spirit, when he has made you a new creature. You don't have to fix your life up to get baptized. You don't have to fix your life up to, to all these things. You need to just follow Christ. Just come. Because he's made it possible. If he is God, and he is declared to be the Son of God without a doubt by the resurrection, what will you do with him? That's the question I will ask you. What will you do with him? Is he Lord, liar, or lunatic? And if he is Lord, there has to be change. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the resurrection. Thank you so much for what you've done on the cross that is validated by your resurrected life. I'm so thankful that I can walk with you and know you. Let's pray for anybody here who wants to come to you and know you. Without a doubt, you are truly God and God alone. And you are willing to forgive them and you are eager to forgive them and eager to bless them and eager to walk with them. I pray for all of us that we would be eager to walk with you, to know you, and to enjoy you forever. In Christ's name, amen.